All right, so good afternoon. So yes, language has always been my thing. I started um, learning Spanish in eighth grade, and they continued that. I started learning French in high school. I had a Japanese pen pal at one point that I wrote to in Japanese. Um, when I was getting my master's degree in Spain, I first became acquainted with the field of linguistics. And it, from the first couple of classes in, I knew that this was my thing. But what is linguistics? And that's what I hope to um, share with you today. As I got deeper into the field of linguistics, I came back to USC and started taking some more graduate level work. I started realizing that linguistics gave me a special insight into language that I hadn't had before, a little bit of mind reading, if you will. So um, if you'll indulge a little bit, I know the hour is getting late, it's Sunday, but I'm going to give you a couple of tests this afternoon. So I wouldn't mind a little bit of audience participation. So linguistics, what is it? Well, let's start with what is it not. So linguistics is not me sitting at home learning a whole bunch of languages. Right? That's just an interest in languages. Linguistics is the study of language, perhaps with a capital L. Language at its most basic, the sounds we produce, the words that we say, the order in which we put the words, how we use language in society. And so today, I want to take you through some of these fields of linguistics and, again, see if I can read your mind a little bit. So let's start with phonetics and phonology, the most basic. So this is the production of and the brain's interpretation of sounds. So the vowels, the consonants, everything that our mouth, our nasal cavity does to produce sounds. So uh, with this, I want to ask you an English question here. So um, how do you make a word plural? So you might think, let's add an S to it, right? In general, that's the way we make words plural. You're kind of right. That's an appeal to writing. But the thing about language is that we speak language before we write it. So let's not think about written language here. Let's think about how we say it. So even today at the table, I have a four-year-old daughter, Tegan, and she today said fingers, z, z, z. Ooh, that ends in a z, right? <laughs> well, she's on the right track, right? Because you see, there are actually three ways that we generally make words plural in English. Here's how we represent that in the world of phonetics. Z and is. All right, we have three options that in general we use to make words plural. So why are there three? How do we know which one to do with each word? So is it just random or there's some system? Here's your first test. I'm going to give you a word that you perhaps have never seen before. I just made it up in creating this presentation. And then I want us all collectively to say the plural of that word. Okay? So. If I give to you, this is one spleech, all right? Just the word spleech. Think about how you would make it plural, and on the count of three, we'll say it together, all right? One, two, three. Spleeches. Spleeches, correct. So even though there are three ways that we make words plural, you all somehow knew, or I was able to predict, that you would put an is on the end. Not spleech or spleech, but spleeches, all right? That's the world of phonetics, the sounds we produce. Now let's take those sounds that we produce and combine them to form meaning. This is the world of morphology. Morphology is the smallest unit of language that has meaning. So in the word bat, we have three sounds, b, a, and t, all right? But it's only when we put these three sounds together that we form something meaningful. The sounds by themselves don't have meaning, but um, the three together make meaning. So, the morpheme that I want to talk about morpheme is the word for the, that which has meaning. I want to talk about prefixes and suffixes a little bit. All right, we know that these exist in English. The prefixes come before a word, and suffixes come afterwards. In the case of unparalleled, the un, the prefix, means not, and weakness, the nest at the end, makes the adjective weak, a noun. There's another type of affix called an infix, all right? Prefix comes before, suffix comes after, infix comes in a word. I present you an example from a, uh, from a language found in Mexico called seri, and they have a verb tick, or uh, the sentence here, did he or she plant it, tick. Now to make the subject, he or she, must make that plural, notice what they do. They take tick and insert iti to, they insert a to in the middle there to make the the sentence plural, to give a plural subject. So you may be looking at this, never heard of this word infix before. It must not exist in English. Does English have, have infixes though? Yes. Absolutely. Right? So, you may have heard that word, right? Uh, so, 
absolutely is formed by taking absolutely and putting the word freaking in the middle of it, right? And what does that do? It provides some emphasis to them, right? We do this with other words, perhaps fantastic and freaking fantastic, right? Or unbelievable, unfreaking believable, right? How do we do this, right? Let's try to find a pattern, all right? So, fantastic, unbelievable, we put it after the first syllable, but that doesn't work for absolutely. All right, absolutely fantastic is three syllables from the end. That doesn't work for unbelievable. So if there's some logic, some system behind it, here's your next test. I'm gonna give you a word that you probably have never put the word freaking into, all right? So, and again, on the count of three, we're gonna say that word all together with the word freaking in it, wherever you think sounds most natural to you, all right? We're gonna go to the animal kingdom, all right? The word alligator, all right? Think about where you would put the word freaking in that, all right? Ready? One, two, three. Alligator. Yeah. All right. Let's try again. Let's stick with the reptiles here. It's reptile, right? Um, crocodile. Think about where would you do it. All right. One, two, three. Crocodile. Freaking out. Freaking out. All right. So maybe you're thinking, okay, you get the two easy ones. It just comes after the second syllable. You put freaking there. <laughs> Maybe that's just it. But if you think that, then you've been being bamboozled, or as we can all say now, you've been been you've been bam freaking boozled. Right. That's morphology. Things that have meaning in our language. Now we've, we've combined sounds to form meaning. Let's let's take these words and combine them together. This is the area of syntax. This is when we talk about subjects, verbs, objects, parts of speech, noun, adjectives, verbs, things like this. Let's talk about adjectives for just a second. I mean, if you students or in a language class, you know that in Spanish and in French, many times our adjectives come after the noun, but in English, adjectives come before the noun they describe. So the black cat. All right. Well, let's think about um, what happens when we have more than one adjective. Are all modifiers created equally? All right. So I want to give you an example here of a box. And I'm going to describe it three different ways, and I'll put it all in one sentence. Here I've got it listed just in alphabetical order, red, tall, and wooden. But in your mind, I want you to think about, okay, if I were saying this sentence with all of these words, what order would I put these in? All right, I got a one in six shot of getting it right. Think about it. You got it in your head? Raise your hand if this is your sentence. I see a tall, red, wooden box. There we go. Most of you here. All right, so... How did we know that? Do you remember in school being taught which order our adjectives in? I don't think so. I'm going to press my luck a little bit. Let's add one more. One in 24 shot. A suitcase. Again, I just put them in alphabetical order. Big, boxy, leather, and old. Think about how would you put this in a sentence. Give me a second. Think about it. Again, raise your hand. Is this your sentence? So again, the majority of you here. Because to say the leather boxy old big suitcase just oh, sounds bad, right? All right, so so that's that syntax. We put the words together, we formed a sentence, and now let's let's put language in society a little bit. All right, the world of semantics, pragmatics. This is the meaning behind what we say, and also just when to use certain things. Now. We can know the meanings of words, but that still might not give us the whole story. The sentence below that I'm going to give you is going to mean something different if you stress a different word. I'm going to first read it as a robot. I didn't sneakily steal your money. Sounds like an alien, actually. But, uh, but it has some meaning. We understand all the words. Well, let's try stressing each different word. I didn't sneakily steal your money. It was him. I didn't sneakily steal your money. I didn't, that's a lie. I didn't sneakily steal your money. <laughs> so it's obvious. I didn't sneakily steal your money. I just hid it conveniently out of sight. I didn't sneakily steal your money. It was hers. Or I didn't sneakily steal your money, but your whole wallet. <laughs> so semantics, pragmatics, that's meaning and the use of language. So it's just kind of incredible that you know, we, you have all demonstrated that we're all thinking along the same wavelength a little bit. We, all, we have similar structure. How did we get here? This is the world of language acquisition, all right? And we can think about first language acquisition, us learning our first language. For many of us, that's English. And then also, 
Second language acquisition, or third language acquisition, that's any, any subsequent language. And actually, they're quite similar in many respects. So when we are learning a language, that necessarily involves going through a sequence of errors. All right, It's trial and error. No one gives you all the rules of English, or Spanish, or whatever your native language might be. But yet, somehow, we just figure it out. And likewise, in your language classes at school, there's going to be things that you just pick up um, as you go. You might be taught some rules, but also you're going to learn more things. But regardless, you're going to be making um, mistakes along the way. And interestingly enough, these errors are systematic, meaning that someone who is two years along in their learning of English, a two-year-old, is going to be doing about the same thing as a two-year-old down the street also learning English. They're going to be producing about the same types of sentences, doing about the, the, the same kinds of things with their verbs. Um, likewise, also in your foreign language classes as well. Right? When you're in class, there's going to be things that you know how to do, and there's going to be some things that you don't know how to do. All right? And your teacher, let's give them some mind reading credit for a second, they know what you're supposed to be doing and not doing, so don't use Google Translate, we know. Okay? <laughs> so, moving on. Sociolinguistics. All right. I've given you all a couple of tests. I'm going to let you, but you be the mind reader for just a little bit. All right. Sociolinguistics is language as used by different groups of people. This could be people from different places, people of different ages, different genders, different socioeconomic um, classes. And so we can define groups of people by how they speak. All right. So the test that I'm going to let you all participate in is the sentence below, was it perhaps written by a British or an American speaker of English? Here we go. Australia has defeated New Zealand to win the soccer match. British or American? American. All right. I heard, I heard a lot of there. I think I remember that. I heard American in there. Why would we say American? Soccer, right? Because we would think that a British person would say football. And you, and you would be correct. Yes, different places we have different vocabularies for things. However, there's more to it. British and American English differ on more than just vocabulary, obviously pronunciation, but also in our morphosyntax, how we form sentences, how verbs agree, because they would not only replace soccer with football, they would also replace has with have as well. Australia have defeated New Zealand to win the football match. So there's actually another field of linguistics called forensic linguistics in which people take ideas like this and are able to use written or spoken language to figure out, okay, what age is this is this person, or where might they be from to help solve crimes? So it's an interesting subfield of linguistics. All right, finally, uh, we get to historical linguistics. It's my personal favorite. It's how language has changed or how language is changing. All right, and so I've heard a lot of people talk about, and I see this in the paper all the time, people decrying, oh, English is just going down the toilet. Kids these days. Right? And their text speak and things like this. But just because language is changing doesn't mean that language is falling apart. Okay, there's a difference there. We've been you've been demonstrating to me that you all have some shared system among you. Okay? Um, so here's your final test here. Um, so start with an example. The word by that we say comes from goodbye is actually a shortening of an expression gotta be with you. Just all the sounds just kind of over time merged together. So the example I want to focus on here as we finish out is the suffix of. Not like uh, but like you're filling in space, but uh, as in going to. Wait, what? You gotta think about this for just a second. Uh comes from gonna, which comes from going to. Like, I'm going to devour some pizza. Or I'm gonna devour some pizza. Or I'm going to devour some pizza, <laughs> right? So does that mean that uh equals going to? All right, here it is. So multiple choice. I'll make it easy for you. All right, A, B, or C. Uh is A, B is going to, and C is both A and B. All right, so think about this one for just a second. What would you fill in the blank with? I'm blank or hard. All right, A, B, or C. What would you say? C. See, you think A and B both work? I would agree with you. I'm going to work hard, or I'm going to work hard. All right, so perhaps a uh, equals going to. What about this one? I'm blank the pool. Just B. Just B, right. So interestingly enough, this is, you know, we've reduced going to to a, uh, right? But yet the 
there's still some system that we share. No one's taught us the rules behind this, but we've picked it up. All right, and and we were able to we were able to learn them to figure out that we only use a uh when it's an action. All right, but we still say going to when it's a physical movement there. So there, there's a system there. So I, I gave this presentation the wrong title. I'm not actually a mind reader. I mean, I do feel like I am privileged to information about language that goes on all around us all the time, but I'm not really a mind reader. It's just I have the terminology and the vocabulary to talk about the system that we share. So perhaps give yourself some credit here because, you know, don't say, oh, I barely know English. You've proven yourself wrong here. You know a lot more about English than you give yourself credit for, right? Even if you don't know how to describe that. You're intimately aware with the rules of your native language. So. Um, I hope that this talk has inspired you to, to perhaps look into the Fiddle Linguistics. It's just miraculous that any of us can learn any language. Um, it's super interesting to me, and I hope you have learned some things as well. Thank you.